to uh, today's lecture about material or, or what's to come in terms of assignments. Okay. So today we're going to talk about coordinate descent. Um, it's uh, one of the topics that I kind of personally like a lot, so I'm excited about it. Um, it's also something that's become extremely popular, like ADMM, like the method we learned last time. It's something that's become extremely popular as of late, so it's a very uh, current topic. So just to remind you what we did last time, um, we talked about dual methods, which might operate on a problem that has this form. Minimize some function f of x subject to ax equals b. We saw that we could also handle inequality constraints and other, other forms, but this is the, probably the easiest one to remember. And the idea behind our lecture last time was, um, suppose we wanted to apply something like subgradient method or, or a gradient ascent to the dual of this problem, but we didn't know the conjugate in closed form, or we didn't want to bother actually deriving it. But well, we saw that we could actually um, repeat the following two steps, where we, we choose some initial guess, u0, that's going to be our initial guess for the dual point. And we're going to first find uh, a primal iterate, xk, that minimizes the Lagrangian when evaluated at the current dual estimate, which is uk minus 1. Once we find that, we're going to then make a dual update of this form. uk is equal to uk minus 1 plus a step size times the discrepancy in the constraint, axk minus 1 minus b. And we saw that we could interpret this exactly as doing something like gradient ascent or, or subgradient method on the dual. Because this quantity here um, is exactly giving us either a subgradient or gradient of the dual criterion, depending on whether or not this was unique, this point xk. Okay, so we derived that last time. Uh, and you know, if, if you wanted to apply proximal uh, dual ascent or accelerated dual ascent or whatever else, you could just do it as usual in this framework, because again, this is just serving as the gradient of the smooth part, or the subgradient. So the, the advantage was that this offered decomposability, in particular with respect to the first step. So if f split up as a function ac across blocks of variables, then so would uh, this in inner product between u and ax. And so this first step could decompose across blocks of variables. And that could be very advantageous if we have a large problem. We want to parallelize, say, this first step. And we couldn't do that in the primal, because even if f split up across blocks of variables, this constraint tied them together. So the advantage of this was that we got separability or, or decomposability in the first step. The disadvantage was that it had poor convergence properties. And we didn't go into that in detail, but I just explained what that meant. Uh, only under strong conditions do we actually get that these iterates, xk, approach even feasibility. Do they even have ax equals b in the limit? And moreover, uh, only under strong conditions are they, do they approach solutions. OK, so if you're interested in more about that, then read the references from last time at the end. We saw that we could actually improve upon this by augmenting the Lagrangian. So we can think about it in two ways. One is that we just add a term to this step that looks like rho over 2 times ax minus b in the norm squared. That's also uh, can be thought of as adding something to the original criterion function, the same term, rho over 2 ax minus b times the norm squared. That wouldn't change anything, wouldn't change the solution, because ax is equal to b at the solution. But it, 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 it can help with the convergence property that we mentioned just now. It'll actually um, imply that we have convergence in primal iterates under weaker conditions. And again, we didn't go into the details as to why that's true, but you can read about it in the references if you're interested. The disadvantage to that is that it, it ruins the decomposability in this first step. Okay, it smooths out the function in some sense by adding what looks like a strongly convex term, but it, it, it now disentangles all the variables together, and so this step is no longer decomposable across blocks, if f were. ADMM is the idea um, that tries to combine the best of both worlds. So we, we would just perform blockwise minimization here. So we would minimize one block after another, 
even though it may not be separable, we would just do that anyways. And that's the ADMM algorithm. And under kind of very broad conditions, we get that that converges uh, under much, yeah, under weaker conditions than, say, the dual decomposition method. Okay, so ADMM is a very kind of powerful uh, tool to have in your toolbox. In part, it's so powerful because it's very simple. When you, when you write down an ADMM algorithm for many problems, it ends up being quite simple, when the alternatives could be quite complicated. OK, today we're going to talk about coordinate descent, which, um, like ADMM, it's a very simple method. It's a very simple idea, you know, arguably even simpler than ADMM. And especially compared to the sophisticated methods we've seen so far, like um, you know, some of the interior point methods, say, um, even some of the Newton method can become complicated with constraints, with equality constraints. Coordinate descent is a very simple uh, approach. And we're going to motivate it by um, the following question. Let's suppose I give you a convex smooth function f, and I tell you that I'm at a point x such that if I move along any coordinate axis, any amount, I cannot make the function any smaller. So I'm at the point x, and I add, let's say, delta times ei, right, where ei is the uh, ith coordinate basis vector. So it just has a 1 in the ith component and 0 everywhere else. And I move along it direction uh, of an amount delta, where delta can be positive or negative. I know that no matter how I do that, I'm always bigger than or equal to f of x. Let's suppose that's true for all delta and for all coordinates i. So uh, in other words, I'm at a coordinate-wise minimum, right? Any coordinate direction that I move along, I only make the function larger. Does that imply that I'm at the global minimizer of the function? for a smooth convex function. Let's take a vote. How many people think the answer is yes? How many people think the answer is no? OK, so it seems like the consensus was yes, but m many of you guys were very shy to say yes. Don't think you really wanted to completely commit to your answer. But the answer is, is yes. Right? And the proof's very simple. The proof is that if I'm at a coordinate-wise minimum, then the partial derivative along every coordinate is going to be 0. right? But that means that the gradient is going to be 0. The function is, is a smooth convex function. Then you know, the existence of partial derivatives and gradients, we've already assumed that. And every partial derivative is 0, so the gradient is 0, so it's minimized at x. Right? So a very simple picture, if I have some smooth convex function in R2, and I just move along, uh, you know, x1, say at, at uh, this point here, or move along x2 at this point here. If in either slice the function only gets bigger, then I've actually minimized the function. OK, so that's a kind of a good start for motivating coordinate descent. How about if the function is convex but not smooth anymore? Here okay, we're going to ask the same question. Is a coordinate-wise minimizer imply a global minimizer to the function? How many people think yes now? How many people think no? Oh, it seems like nobody's answering. Let's try that again. How many people, it doesn't matter if you're wrong, you're not being graded. How many people think yes? And how many people think no? OK, uh, it seems maybe like a split decision, but yes maybe was a bit, a bit more common. The answer is actually no. And all we need is a counterexample to show that this is true. Right, so let's think about the following counterexample. Um, I have this function. It looks like a boat, for lack of a better word. It just looks like a, you know, this um, non-differentiable uh, part here looks like the hull of a boat, in some sense. And let's support, suppose I'm at some point here, right, that lies along this kind of non-differentiable uh, manifold. Just pick a point here. And um, to think about the, the, the fact that it's a coordinate-wise minimizer, let's draw its, its uh, contours. So all I've done is I've actually sliced this picture at many different heights. And I've, I've drawn the contours here that result from that. And so the point that we're interested in, let's say it lies here, on the hull of the boat right here. And here are the, um, what it looks like on, in the contour plot. If I move along direction x1, 
you can see that actually I only reach higher and higher contours. So I can't make the function any smaller. So if I just slice this picture and move along x1, the function only gets bigger along, or sorry, along x2 in this case, only gets bigger along x2. The same story is true for x1. If I, if I go to this point and I move along x1, I only reach higher and higher contours. So if I move this way, I only kind of move up and up the, the, uh, the boat. But if I move jointly in the direction x1 and x2, I can bring myself to the, the minimizer, which lies somewhere kind of in the center of the picture. All right, so here's an example for a non-differentiable convex function where uh, a coordinate-wise minimizer does not imply that we have the global minimizer. OK, so it seems like, at least so far, if we're going to seek a coordinate-wise minimizer with some strategy, which we haven't explained yet, it may not even work, depending on what the function, what properties the function satisfies. And now we're going to go with one last question, which is, what happens if I take a sum of functions, one that's smooth, we'll call it g, and then a bunch of convex functions, so g is smooth and convex, a bunch of convex functions, call them hi, but hi is separable in the sense that hi is only a function of xi. So it's non-smooth, it's convex, but it separates across coordinates. What do you guys think? Is it going to be, uh, are we going to get that a coordinate-wise minimizer implies the global minimizer? Let's see how many people think yes. OK, now everyone raised their hand, because otherwise we probably wouldn't finish on this example. So an astute observation. But yeah, the answer is yes. And actually, the proof is, is very simple. Um, first, let me just give you uh, an idea of, of how these counterexamples um, disappear. So if I take the following picture, asking for it to be separable is, in a sense, rotating this so that the contours are aligned with the coordinate axis. So this problem goes away. So even if I had non-differentiability across both coordinate axes, which I'm allowing for here, um, you can see that at any one of these non-differentiability points here, I don't have a coordinate-wise minimizer anymore. Right? It's only here that I do. So um, what's the proof that this is, this is the case? Well, um, let's just make a, a, a few very simple arguments that just stem from the properties you know about convexity and subgradients. You'll see that it actually follows directly. Let's suppose that I'm at a, such a point x. So x is the coordinate-wise minimizer. And now I'm just going to take any other point y and look at the difference between f of y and f of x. Remember, this is going to be g of y plus h of y um, minus g of x plus h of x. And we're going to use two facts now. The first fact we're going to use is that since g is smooth and convex, we can actually lower bound g of y minus g of x by its first order Taylor approximation. Right? We know that g of y is always bigger than or equal to g of x, plus the gradient of g of x transpose y minus x. It's just a property of smooth convex functions. So let's take this difference and lower bound it, like I said, by the gradient of g of x transpose y minus x. For this difference, h of y minus h of x, let's just remember that h split up as a sum of functions across coordinates. So I'm just going to do h i x i minus h i y i. OK? Now let's, let's uh, rearrange this in just a very simple way. This is an inner product, right, across components. So I can always uh, incorporate that into the sum as follows. Just take the ith component of the gradient, which I'll write like this, times yi minus xi. Right? This is just exactly that sum. And I'll just include this term in the sum as well, plus h of xi minus hi of yi. And now, what is this? Well, I actually claim this is bigger than or equal to 0, right? for the exact same reason as we basically had earlier, which is that if we think about the function along just the ith component, just the ith coordinate, 
then we, are, we know it's a coordinate-wise minimizer. So that function along the ith component, which looks like this, is going to uh, satisfy exactly this property, right? that this is bigger than or equal to 0. This is just saying that xi is the, comp the component-wise minimizer along component i. OK? So then, that, therefore, the entire thing is bigger than or equal to 0. Another way to see this, if you wanted to see this, is that think about this function along the ith uh, coordinate axis and take a subgradient of uh, fi, or yeah, f along the direction xi. And the condition that it's minimized at xi will exactly imply that this is bigger than or equal to 0 for all yi. It's another just way of phrasing that. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. That just was a typo. Any questions about that? OK. So what we've learned is that in a sense, if we are interested in, in minimizing functions that are a sum of smooth plus separable functions, each of which is convex, then the, uh, the existence of a coordinate-wise minimizer guarantees a global minimizer. So it seems to suggest that we can apply a strategy which just seeks the coordinate-wise minimizer and then terminates once we've done so. And that's a strategy we tend to call coordinate descent. And unfortunately, there's kind of a, um, I'd say there's not a standard in naming here. So some people call this coordinate-wise minimization. Some people call it coordinate descent. And we're going to just talk briefly later. There's actually a difference between what you might think about coordinate descent in the strict sense and what we're suggesting here. But I'm just following the nomenclature in statistics and machine learning, which is to call this strategy coordinate descent. You could really think about it like cyclic coordinate minimization. So we start with some initial guess, x0, and we repeat the following steps over and over again. We just first of all look at the function only along the first coordinate uh, direction, so only as a function of x1. And with the current values of all the other coordinates plugged in, we try to minimize that function in a univariate sense. And we call that uh, iterate you know, x1k. It's our, it's our update to x1. Then we do the same thing for the second iterate, except now we fix all but the second coordinate, and we minimize over that coordinate to get um, the updated value for the second coordinate, and so on and so forth until we get to the last coordinate, where we fix the function uh, according to the first n minus 1 variables, we minimize over the last one. Then when we get to that step, we actually repeat. We go back and minimize with respect to the first coordinate, and we cycle through. So one cycle of coordinate descent would be a full set of n minimizations. But they're only univariate, right? So in, in many situations, we'll see this actually is each of these minimizations is, can be quite cheap. So a full cycle of coordinate descent is, is n minimizations, univariate minimizations, and then we just repeat that over and over again. Now, what's a very important point? After we solve for, say, let's say x1, uh, we have an updated value of x1. In the step for x2, we actually pass in the updated value for x1. So we're not using x1 at the previous iteration, at iteration k minus 1. We're using the most recent value for each component at every step of the minimization. So in a sense, the information is being fed forward, right? We're, we're always carrying forward the most recent updates for the coordinates. That's called cyclic coordinate descent. So there's, this is a very old idea in optimization, although, to be honest, it was largely ignored for many years. I don't think it was, is that fair, Javier? It wasn't really a, a topic that was um, you know, paid nearly as close attention to as, say, interior point methods, although it's a very, very old idea. And there's a bunch of papers um, and even books that cover kind of classic uh, convergence analyses for coordinate descent, simply that it converges under mild conditions. One of the kind of more thorough treatments is given by Paul Sang, um, who's, I think, known in large part for his body of work on coordinate descent. 
who very sadly passed away a few years ago. Um, he's, he was very young. But he, he's a, you know, really kind of the court descent guru, in some sense, out of the optimization community. And he has a nice paper in 2001 that proves that uh, if we have a function f that's you know, smooth plus separable, and um, under some very mild conditions, like it has to attain its minimum, then any limit point of this, any limit point is going to be a minimizer of the function f. Right? So if we, can, if we do this over and over again and we, we get some, some limit point of that sequence, then that's going to be a minimizer of the function f. Okay, and, and so just a, you know, a few kind of maybe minor technical notes. Um, how do we know that there's going to be a limit point? Well, we don't know there's going to be a limit point, but because uh, under the assumption that you know, this initial sublevel set is compact, we'll never leave that sublevel set because coordinate descent is a proper descent method. You can convince yourself that at every step, we're only making the criterion value smaller and smaller. Right? It's a very simple inductive argument that would make that would show that's true. And so we're never going to leave this initial compact set. So we have a sequence that's in a compact set, and it's going to have uh, it's going to have a subsequence that converges then, right? Just by kind of standard results in, in real analysis. And the, the optimal criterion value, or the criterion values are always going to converge to the optimal criterion value. That's just because of monotone convergence. Again, another kind of standard result in real analysis. So this is, in a, in a sense, it's a pretty strong result. It's not giving us a convergence rate, but it's telling us that for any smooth plus separable function, we're in, a pretty, we're in pretty good shape if we apply cyclic court and wise minimization. Um, there, are, there are other papers that um, Paul Sang has written that give kind of more, um, more detailed results for spe more special cases. He even has some papers on doing court descent for non-convex minimization problems, where the, where the smooth part is, say, non-convex. So that some notes are that the order of the cycle is arbitrary. We can use any permutation of 1 through n. It didn't really matter. We chose to, to visit the coordinates 1 through n in that order. And in fact, there are you know, other relaxed rules which say that as long as we visit a coordinate, uh, any given coordinate, and say a number of th after a number of cycles that grows linearly with n, you know, we could visit it after two n steps instead of just after n steps. Any rules like that are going to have the same convergence properties. So that the notion of a cycle is just there for simplicity, but you know really uh, permutations of 1 through n, or if we, if we don't visit a coordinate until you know, something like 3 n steps later, that's OK, too. It'll have all the same convergence properties. Um, we can everywhere replace individual coordinates with blocks of coordinates. So that's, I'm going to kind of use coordinate descent and block coordinate descent synonymously throughout the lecture. So this didn't have to be an actual decomposition into coordinates of x. It could be blocks of coordinates. Right? Each xi could be a block of coordinates of, of some arbitrary length. We just would be minimizing over that block of coordinates in each of these steps. And they can have different lengths, too. Okay, So block coordinate descent is really, there's no difference in that sense. Um, this one at a time update is critical. So doing all at once updates does not necessarily converge. Okay, So in other words, if I took the value of uh, x1 in, at the previous iteration here, x1 k minus 1, and plug that in here, and only until the full cycle did I actually use the kth iterate, then that's not necessarily going to converge. It's not the same as court descent. It's a common mistake, misconception people have in their mind. Right? So I have to carry forward the most recent version of the iterate at every step. At the ith step, I'm using the most recent version of xi, x1 through xi minus 1 at iteration k, and I'm using the old version of xi plus 1 through xn, because right? I haven't updated them yet. That's, in a sense, it's kind of too bad that I can't just use the old version at every step, right? Because if I could, then I could really truly parallelize these steps. I could actually solve each of these in parallel. But according to this convergence result, we can't do that. We have to actually solve them in a proper sequence and feed forward the most recent value. Otherwise, it won't necessarily converge. Um, an interesting kind of connection is that for solving a linear system, right? I, we talked about this very briefly in the numerical linear algebra lecture, but you would have seen this in other classes, likely. This is exactly the difference between Gauss-Seidel and Jacobi methods. Right? So the Gauss-Seidel method for solving a linear system, it tries to satisfy that linear system along the ith coordinate at every step, cyclically, 
and it uses the most recent information at every step. The Jacobi method is the same thing, but it uses uh, the information all from the previous cycle. It doesn't actually feed forward the most recent val values. So the, the Jacobi method can be paralyzed. The gauss seidel method, method, kind of generally speaking, cannot. But it's the same idea. gauss seidel is always going to converge, and the Jacobi method is not necessarily going to converge. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, does the convergence result uh, require that every coordinate solution is exact or very precise, or can we just approach it like take a step and work? That's a very good question. So this one requires that the minimizations are exact. But we're going to talk about coordinate descent in a, in a kind of more proper use of the word descent, where we only actually take a descent step in each direction, not necessarily a full minimization. And we'll see that that actually has its own set of convergence results as well. Do we also require that uh, every variable from x1 to x10 is minimized once? Because sometimes you get superability in the object function, but every term involved in the amount of like a few number of x's, but they're, they're not completely superable. Yes, that's a good question. Um, the answer is generally we have to otherwise not guarantee conversions. There are many exceptions. And um, those exceptions require specific treatment of that problem. So support vector machines are actually one exception. Some of the earliest algorithms for support vector machines, which we'll go through in a few slides, do a, a block two coordinate minimization. So they minimize over two blocks of coordinates at a time. But the objective's not separable. The dual objective. But yeah, the answer is, in general, you need separability. I mean, there are many examples of where a function that looks kind of innocuous because maybe only ties together variables in a very kind of minor way. Maybe one variable only ever depends on another, one other variable. You, you can kind of have, um, you can hit fixed points in coordinate descent that aren't global minimizers. Yeah, Dallas. Uh, if there's multiple variables in one function, we can join and minimize over all those variables. Yeah, so that's, that's an, uh, a good kind of clarification. So if the, if the function is not separable in individual coordinates, but blocks of coordinates, you can still apply the same logic, as long as the blocks actually separate. But you're going to have to actually minimize over the whole block. OK, um, just a name to help you remember the difference between coordinate descent and the version where you, uh, you, you don't update the most recent coordinate at a time, but you, you just kind of perform one cycle, ignoring the fact that you updated x1, et cetera, and then you only update the next step. That, the, the version of coordinate descent, as we lear learned it, is sometimes called the shooting method. That was a name that's, I think, I don't really know the history of that, but that was a name that was given to it in uh, the late 90s, at least in statistics. And there have been recent attempts to uh, uh, derive coordinate descent approaches that actually can be parallelized in the sense that they don't need to feed forward the most recent information. Each of these can be done in parallel with the old version. Those are called shotgun methods sometimes. The difference between maybe kind of, I'm not sure what, what the actual proper analogy here is, but think about the shotgun method just kind of does it all at once. Right, and shooting method goes for each um, coordinate-wise minimization in sequence. So you'll, you'll find some recent papers in the last couple of years that try to actually develop versions of coordinate descent that can be parallelized in special situations. Though in general, as we said here, um, shotgun schemes, if you wish, are not necessarily going to converge. So let's go through some examples so that we see um, kind of concretely the strengths of coordinate descent. The first example we're going to treat is linear regression, right? We know what the answer is here. You think, why would I ever apply coordinate descent to solve a linear system? Well, um, believe it or not, some very large scale linear system solvers actually uh, perform updates that are kind of like this. They have you know, other kind of tricks to them, but they are based on ideas like randomized coordinate descent. Um, and I have a reference at the end for, some, for, for such a paper that covers that. So let's think about just minimizing this smooth criterion, right? the least squares loss between y and x beta. And we're going to call the columns of x, x1 through xp. So we can think about this as right, minimizing um, 
we can write it like this. Y uh, minus the sum of x, j, beta, j, j equals 1 to p. And that's going to help us when we apply uh, coordinate-wise minimization, say, over coordinate j. So here I have in the slides, let's suppose we want to minimize over beta i with all others fixed. How would we do that, right? So it's a very simple calculation we have to do. That's it. We're just going to separate out all the terms that don't depend on beta i. Right, so this is our problem. Minimize over only beta i. And this is still smooth, of course, so we can just take its uh, derivative, or you know, partial derivative with respect to beta i, set it equal to 0, and then we'll get an update rule for beta i. Another way of thinking about it is that this is just a one-dimensional quadratic. Right, that's all it is. Um, yeah, we can think about it in various ways, right? So um, maybe the easiest way to think about it is just by uh, thinking about it as a one-dimensional quadratic, right? So I can think about this as the same as minimizing over beta i. Uh, I get the norm of x i squared um, times beta i squared. That's what I get if I square this part. And uh, then I get minus uh, 2y transpose, or sorry, y minus xj beta j transpose xi beta i plus a constant term, right, which is this thing squared, which doesn't depend on beta i, so we don't have to worry about it. And if I minimize this one dimensional quadratic, right, I just take this, so I take minus b over 2 times a. So I get the update that beta i has to be equal to uh, minus b ends up being, it's just x i transpose y minus sum of x j beta j, j not equal to i. Divided by the norm of x i squared. OK. so. Simple calculation. I basically just take the residual and then do univariate regression on that residual. It's another way you can think about it, right? I'm just doing a univariate regression of xi on the residual. This is also kind of an interesting formula because we know that um, from you know, classical statistics, one uh, property of the, of the joint regression coefficients is that if I ever seek a, uh, the jth, or say the ith, joint regression coefficient, I can actually project out all the other variables from y and all the other variables from xi and do univariate regression of you know, that projected out xi onto that projected out y. And that should give me the, uh, the proper um, ith coefficient in the multiple linear regression of y on all of the x's. And this, is, this formula is seeking that, right? It's just trying to project out, in a sense, all of the other variables before it performs univariate regression. So it's just trying to get to that. And so we repeat this update, right, for i equals 1 through p, i equals 1 through p, i equals 1 through p, et cetera. So let's just do a very simple comparison. This is something I just did. Very sim simple simulation of coordinate descent versus gradient descent. And I'm comparing one full cycle of coordinate descent so that it updates all the variables. So one full cycle is it's going to go through i equals 1 through p. So we get a, a new version of, of beta 1 through beta p to one iter iteration of gradient descent, which also updates beta 1 through beta p. OK, so they are, in a sense, they're kind of applying the same amount of work to all of the components. And you can see the convergence is very different. Right? This is gradient descent um, over, I think I ran 100 instances, and I just plotted all of the instances here of their, uh, the difference between the, you know, the criterion of the kth iteration and the optimal criterion value across the steps, number of steps they take. So again, this is number of cycles taken by coordinate descent. Coordinate descent's in blue, gradient descent's in red. And you can see that 
I mean, every instance of coordinate descent was much faster than every instance of gradient descent. There was no instances that were even close, and these are the average uh, convergence curves. They're very far from each other. All right, so by the time that coordinate descent gets to below 10 to the minus 10 accuracy, gradient descent looks like it's at maybe 10 to the minus 5. So they're in completely different regimes. Yeah? Oh, sorry. So what I did was I, I generated different instances of the data, y and x, 100 times. It's a deterministic algorithm that's being applied. Yeah, good question. 100, 100 different problems. Yeah? Is this batch gradient descent rather than stochastic? Yeah, good question. It is batch gradient descent. Yeah. Yeah? So how, how is this different from the stochastic gradient descent that we did before? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So um, let's just draw a little. I'm gonna come, I want to come back to this, uh, this slide still. But let's just take a kind of a brief detour and think about the difference between a stochastic method and um, coordinate descent. Right, so stochastic methods, they actually separate over instances. Right, so in a stochastic method, I have something that looks like this. I want to minimize this. So right, where each of these functions is going to be a function of the full set of variables, but they separate over instances. So this is a sum from i equals 1 to n. And so for linear regression, right, I might write this as the sum from i going from 1 to n of yi minus xi transpose beta squared. So xi here is a row of the matrix x. Right, so in stochastic gradient descent, or say block, stochastic, or mini batch, or whatever variant you want, we, only, we pick only some of the instances over which to perform a gradient step. But the gradient step is still performed with respect to all components of the optimization variable. For court descent, right, so this is something like, we'll call it in incremental gradient. For, for court descent, it's actually not the instances that we care about. It's the, it's the uh, decomposition of the variables themselves, the optimization variable itself. So um, the easiest way to write it is maybe to keep the norm there. So this is the exact same problem. I'm not changing anything. Just expressing the loss in two different ways. This is a column of x. OK, my, my handwriting is probably not that revealing, but this is supposed to be a capital X. It's supposed to be a lowercase x, just to differentiate between the two. And we seek to actually minimize over coordinates of the optimization variable, not over instances. So they, they do different things. Combination of these two is possible, though. Right, we, may, we may choose, say, a mini batch, like a set of instances over which to perform a coordinate update or coordinate updates. Good question. Hopefully that's clear. Yeah. Simplify ADMM version. Simplify ADMM. Where you don't have a straight code. The second step of the ADMM. Yes, I think it's a very good um, question. So both ADMM and court descent, in a sense, perform blockwise minimization. The difference is that ADMM, um, it has a dual variable because it has a constraint, and so it, it kind of incorporates that in minimizing the Lagrangian instead of just the criterion. Um, you could think about court descent as a version of ADMM without constraints, although the analyses that are um, performed to analyze each are very different. So, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, in a sense, ADMM doesn't need to even have separability, right? Because the constraint is tying together the variables, but we're just kind of uh, blockwise minim minimizing over it anyways. 
So corn scent may be an even simpler situation in some sense. OK, I want to come back to this comparison between corn descent and gradient descent because it's getting, it's get, we're going to get to a point where we can see really the power of corn descent practically. Um, no one scoffed at this comparison, maybe because half the slide was giving away the answer. But um, you know, if I didn't write this down and you didn't happen to look at it, you may have objected to me comparing one cycle of court descent to one iteration of gradient descent. Because it may seem like they actually have different computational costs. Right? Come, come look back at this. Um, this is a single coordinate-wise update. What's a gradient update look like? This would be a good test to see whether you've completely forgotten gradient descent. For linear regression, what does a gradient update look like here? So we'll call it beta plus is equal to beta, and then what goes on the other side? Let's suppose the step size, I'll just call it t. So minus t times the gradient. The gradient is I'm certain you guys know this. Somebody just want to say it? What's that? The, the loss function is this one, right, or the one on the slide. What's the gradient here? Yeah, it's x transpose, say, y minus x beta. That, this is the, the gradient is minus this, right, just the gradient of a quadratic, of, uh, of least squares loss, a quadratic form. So this is the gradient update. OK, so is it fair to compare? p of these to one of these? That's the question. Well, it may not seem that way, right? Because yes, I'm having to um, do, say, p outer inner products. Here I do x i with each of these. And here I do x i with each of these. But what happens on the inside? Here I compute a single matrix multiplication. Here I'm essentially computing p matrix multiplications. Because I can think about this as x i transpose y minus x minus i times beta minus i, where if I had better handwriting, you would see the difference in these minus signs. This just means I'm looking at the, the matrix x with all but the ith component, all but the ith row, uh, column in it, and the, uh, the vector beta with all but the ith component. Right, so actually here I have to form, I have to form kind of like p matrix vector products per cycle because I have to do this for each i, and here I only have to do x beta. So again, you, you may think that I'm doing much more work with court descent, but here's where court, uh, kind of court descent plus very careful implementation um, can save you a lot, which is that actually I claim there's a scheme. There's a scheme for a full cycle that costs on the order of NP flops. And this, this costs an order of NP flops as well, right? Because I have to do a matrix multiplication here, that's NP flops, and then another matrix multiplication that's also on the order of NP flops. Okay, so we can actually make these have very similar computational times. And it comes with a kind of clever uh, update to the residual. So did I explain it here? So um, another way to rewrite the update, like let's rewrite the, the, the ith coordinate update as uh, beta i gets xi transpose the current residual, right? This is um, y minus all but the ith variable uh, times all but the ith column of x divided by the norm of xi squared. So if I have the residual, this just takes um, n flops, right? So this single update given r takes n flops. 
So if I had R and I just did P of these, I would take N P flops. Right? So how do, I, how do I make sure that I can get R in an amount of time, or update R in an amount of time, that doesn't cost me, say, more than order N flops? Because if I can update R in order N flops, and then I perform this step in order N flops, then the ith update is order N, and P of them costs order NP. So we have to come up with some clever trick for updating the residual. Well, that's actually not, um, not bad at all, right? Because remember, let's suppose R was equal to Y minus X minus I, beta minus I, and we stored that at the ith step. So this is at the ith step. At the I plus first step, how do I, what do I do for R? I take R to be what it was previously. I have to add in X I beta I, and I have to subtract off X minus uh, I plus one, say beta, uh, sorry. That should just be X I plus one. Beta I plus one. Right, so we're adding back in the I, uh, product of xi and beta i, and then we're getting, we're taking out x minus i plus one and beta i plus one. So this update to r also costs order n flops. Just taking whatever it was initially, I'm adding something that's of length n and subtracting something that's of length n. So therefore, done cleverly, let's say, full coordinate descent cycle takes uh, order n p-flops. OK, so when you look at coordinate descent implementations in practice, they all hinge on ideas like this, right? There's a lot of information shared across updates to coordinate sense, so we try to utilize that information in the smartest way possible to save computational time. So really, it's fair to compare these two. Here's another thing that may um, leave an impression on you. Here's the same example, but I've added accelerated gradient descent. So I've brought coordinate descent, uh, sorry, gradient descent, down from a one over epsilon rate to one over the square root of epsilon rate, or said differently, one over k to one over k squared convergence rates. You can see that there, neither is still anywhere close to coordinate descent. Okay, just to give you an idea of the um, convergence rate achieved by coordinate descent here, it's very far from a first order method rate. This is the optimal rate for first order methods. This is that achieved by coordinate descent. I can't show you what Newton's method looks like. I can't show you the second order rate here. Why is that? Yeah, it's what Newton would solve in one step, right? Because it's just a quadratic. But just to give you an idea, it's very far from a first order convergence rate. So it's important to remember that's not a contradiction. We're not, coordinate descent is not a first order method. It's using much more than first order information, right? It's actually doing a exact minimization along each coordinate. It's much more than just using, using the gradient information. So it can do much, much better. Let's take a, a break and we'll come back and see some more examples a part where we can do a kind of a survey of the work that's been done recently on coordinate descent. So let's think about one step up from linear regression, which is something like lasso regression. So regression with an, N, an L1 penalty. So this, this guy, right, you might have laughed that we were doing coordinate descent, like I said, because we have a closed form solution for, for the, the S. Um, we have a closed form for the solution here. But lasso, we don't, right? We know that. We have to run say proximal gradient, we could turn this into a, a method that we could apply an interior point method uh, to, we could do one of many things here. Coordinate descent is still very, very simple. Still a very simple method. Um, and it's only a step up from linear regression. Look back at this, the form of this update. The only difference between what we do when we have linear regression as our loss and if we have least squares plus an L1 penalty as our loss, is that we take that and we soft threshold. Right? So therefore, the cost of a full cycle of coordinate descent is still order NP. It's still as cheap as proximal gradient. 
And you could have the same plots. You can show that one cycle of coordinate descent absolutely kills one proximal gradient update. So in a sense, this per cycle is much faster than proximal gradient, even accelerated proximal gradient. How do we derive that rule? Uh, again, it's very simple. All we had now is that for lasso, say if we're just looking at the minimum over beta i, let's just think about all the terms that involve beta i. I can write it like this. I've thrown out all the other terms in, this, in the penalty that don't depend on beta i, because we're minimizing over beta i, right? And so now all this is is a one-dimensional quadratic plus an absolute value. And through kind of very similar arguments to what we gave to derive the prox operator for the L1 norm, in fact, it's the exact same argument. You can show that the minimizer here is just the soft thresholded version of the minimizer of the quadratic. Okay, and what we end up taking as the level is um, now it's going to be lambda over the norm of xi squared of whatever we had before. Okay, so all we have to think about is essentially a univariate minimization problem that's one dimensional quadratic plus an absolute value. If you take the subgradient and set it equal to zero, for example, you'd see immediately that the answer is take the minimizer of the quadratic and soft threshold it. Okay, so very, very simple algorithm for the lasso. And we'll come back to this. This is one of the most, um, it's one of the simplest and one of the most competitive methods for, uh, L, say, L1 penalized regression or L1 penalized estimation in general. Okay, because all we do is something followed by a soft threshold. That's something if we're, if we're doing it properly, if we're doing it cleverly, takes only order n time, and therefore um, the whole iteration is order n time, and, and the whole cycle is order np. I also want to give you an example of uh, a box constrained regression problem. Right? It's a very, very simple method here as well. Instead of just soft thresholding, we're truncating, using a truncation operator here. So we're projecting onto the box. You can think about this actually as projected coordinate descent in some sense. But you can also think about it in our um, in our current framework, because if I have minimized the say least squares loss subject to an infinity norm constraint on beta. Then I can rewrite that as minimizing the least squares loss plus, I'm going to rewrite this as the indicator that the infinity norm is less than or equal to s. Right? But actually, that indicator breaks up into a sum of indicators across each coordinate, i equals 1 through p. Right? Because if any one of the coordinates is uh, bigger than s, this is going to be infinity. Otherwise, if they're all less than or equal to s and absolute value, this is zero. It's exactly the same as this. And this is smooth plus separable. This is hi of beta i. This is g of beta. So it fits into our framework. Okay, so we would just have to minimize this over beta i alone, and you'll see that I'm actually having to minimize a quadratic subject to a one dimensional box constraint. I just minimize over beta i alone. Okay, so it fits into our framework. I also should have mentioned this. Um, when we talked about lasso, let's, uh, let's just kind of be certain that we can apply coordinate sent to the lasso. Right? We can write that like this. And this is going to be our g. I should have said this. And this is our hi of beta i. So it is, again, smooth plus separable. So we know that coordinate descent is going to converge here. Okay. So b 
wary, though, of thinking that, you know, because cornerstone applies in one situation, it'll apply in, in a very similar one. What happens if I, instead of, instead of minimizing the penalized lasso problem, I minimize the constrained lasso problem? Wrote this like this subject to the constraint that the one norm is less than or equal to s, some, some level s. Is that smooth plus separable anymore? So if you think about it, it's not. I can't write the indicator function of the L1 norm being less than or equal to s as a sum of indicator functions across components. I cannot do constrained lasso with court and ascent. OK, how about the box problem? Can I, um, instead of minimizing the constrained version of this problem, can I minimize the penalized version of this problem? Can I write this like this plus lambda times the L infinity norm of beta? can't, right? Because the infinity norm of beta does not separate ac across components. The maximum component of beta and absolute value is not a sum of functions of the individual components. So I chose to give you these examples because they fit into the core descent framework. Somewhat kind of maybe bizarrely, they're cousins, so the penalized version of this one and the constrained version of lasso, don't, you can't apply core descent to those. Right? We need smooth plus separable. Um, SVMs can be done with court descent uh, as well. In fact, one of the earliest algorithms for SVMs called sequential minimal optimization is basically doing blockwise court descent in blocks of two. Um, so we're doing court descent on the dual of the SVM, and we choose blocks of two, so a block of two variables and the dual coordinate alpha to minimize over. And you can see that if we do that, we're going to get we're going to minimize um, a two-dimensional quadratic over a box. But this constraint constrains that two-dimensional quadratic to lie in a line. So the inner problems look like minimize really a univariate quadratic over an interval. Because again, the criterion in alpha 1 and alpha 2 jointly is a two-dimensional quadratic, say. This gives us a box constraint. So we would have to minimize, without this equality constraint, we have to minimize over the quadratic over a box. But with this equality constraint, it constrains that quadratic to lie in a line. So it ends up looking like this. Minimize really a univariate quadratic uh, over an interval. And I, I skip the details here for lack of time. This is an example where I mentioned earlier it's not separable in blocks of coordinates. So the original paper um, had a different kind of convergence analysis than what you would see in coordinates on papers. Now there are kind of many further developments on how we minimize SVMs with court descent. And they don't really look like this anymore. So this was the first. I just wanted to acknowledge it because it was an early um, method for SVMs. You, if you want to look at a more recent paper, there's this um, it's misspelled. It should be H-S-I-E-S-H -S -E um, that I've linked in the references. So let me give you a brief history of court descent and statistics in ML, just because it's kind of interesting. And then we'll go into. Um, maybe a, a more broad perspective of the strategy that it, it uses for loss of regression, and then we'll talk about some theory for court descent. And if we have time, some, some more examples. So th like I said, it's a very old idea in terms of the optimization community, although it was not really um, a focus of the optimization community, I think, until the recent wave of interest in statistics and ML. So the interest in stat and ML brought attention to court descent in such a way that people in optimization thought that it was worth revisiting. Um, in statistics, you know, everything gets reinvented, right, when fields don't, aren't so close together. So in statistics, back in the 90s, people in stats and ML was you know, barely a, it was not really a, a very um, cohesive community back then. There's a bunch of papers which basically invent court descent, not really knowing that it was a method in optimization, and apply it to various problems in stats and ML. And so the earliest one that I'm aware of is this paper by Wen Jiang Fu in 1998. And this is what he calls the shooting method. And then it was uh, kind of reinvented again in 2004 by Ingrid de Bashis, who's a very famous um, researcher who, works, who has a lot of work on wavelets. And these are nice papers. They, you know, they, they display the strengths of the, of the court descent, but they were kind of inexplicably ignored for many years. And there were three papers in 2007 that came out at the same time. Um, around the same time. 
And these really sparked interest in core descent and stats and ML. And this paper probably you know, is the one that people cite the most commonly, but there are two other papers that I li listed in the back that were at the exact same time, essentially. And um, you know, what, one rumor I've heard, I'm not sure if it's verified, is that um, the authors of this paper actually were aware of, of Fu's 1998 paper. And in fact, one of the authors of this paper was Fu's PhD advisor. But at the time, he actually implemented, he or, he or she, I won't say, um, give you too many details, he actually implemented Fu's algorithm incorrectly. So he implemented it in the way that actually does not update the coordinates in a feed-forward manner, and he found that it didn't converge. And so they gave up on it for almost 10 years. And only years later, like nine, 10 years later, that they actually realized that there was a distinction between these two ideas. And upon kind of properly implementing it, they saw that it was a very uh, worthwhile method. And so, like I said, this paper is the one people cite the most, but there are earlier papers as well. Um, and a credit is pay paid to these authors now as well. So why is it used? It's very simple and easy to implement. So you know, implementing coordinate descent requires you just to think about a bunch of one-dimensional minimizations. If you have a problem that has a nice structure, you'll be able to do those in closed form. And it's very simple. It's a very simple idea. There are no tuning parameters here. Right? There's no notion of a step size. There's no complicated notions of backtracking parameters or barrier method parameters. As far as uh, optimization goes, it's a pretty simple method. And if you implement it carefully, so if you move beyond simplicity to impl implementations that can kind of utilize information across steps in a clever way, they can be very close to state of the art. And in fact, they can actually attain state of the art in many instances. And they're very scalable. You don't need to have the full data set in memory. If you look at those coordinate descent rules, we can kind of kick in and out the relevant chunks uh, from memory to perform these updates. If you look back and see the linear regression update, you might think about a scheme for doing so. So there are many examples of applying coordinate descent across common stat and ML problems. I listed some of them here. There's a bunch of papers in the back for you to read if you're interested. Um, let me briefly describe why court descent can be so efficient for the lasso, aside from what you already saw. And this is really what's laid out in that Friedman uh, paper in 2007, and, and then they have an, another paper in 2009 that gives more details. So it uses two kind of elements um, in its implementation to, uh, to achieve a pretty fast speed in terms of um, the cost of each iteration and also the number of iterations required be before conversions. The first is that it always uses a pathwise strategy. So even if you want a solution at some value of lambda, say lambda equals 10, these authors recommend, and they have um, software that's kind of widely used in R and MATLAB and in Fortran, that solves a sequence of problems with the last lambda value being equal to the one you wanted. So if you wanted the solution at lambda equals 10, they're going to solve the problem for much larger lambda values, and they're going to use the solutions to warm start the, uh, the optimizations at smaller lambda values until they reach your lambda value. And that's done because uh, these problems for larger lambda values can be solved much more quickly than they can for smaller lambda values. And so it ends up being actually efficient to solve more problems than needed just to get one solution at lambda. And the reason why they're more efficient, you can see from what they do uh, explained here for each value of lambda, which is that they perform one coordinate cycle. So if you, if you are interested in the solution at, at, say, lambda 1, they perform one coordinate cycle, one sweep of the coordinates, and they see which variables have been thresholded to 0. And they actually just leave those alone, and they only look at the coordinates that remain away from 0, right? Because we know that one cycle of coordinate descent it is going to put some variables exactly to zero because of this soft thresholding operation. Everything that's not equal to zero, what's called the active set, they only iterate over that active set until conversions. So if you have 10,000 variables, and at lambda one, the first sweep eliminated 9,000 of them, then you have 1,000 left in the active set, and they iterate over that active set until conversions. Once the algorithm's converged, they perform another full sweep, and they see whether or not the KKT conditions are met for the full set of variables. If they're violated, Right? If it happens that one variable violates its KKT condition, it's put back in the active set, and that's uh, iterated until conversions. Usually, and there's not theory really yet for, for why this works as well as it does, but usually one or two cycles at the start will detect mostly the right set of active variables from the optimization perspective. There's nothing here to do with statistical 
recovery, just optimization. And so by the time you're done, done iterating over the active set, you've, you're, you're finished, because the KKT conditions will be satisfied for all of the, the variables. The ones that were put to zero initially should have remained at zero for the entire sequence of cycles, so it didn't matter that you actually ignored them. And now you can see why it's so efficient for large lambda. It's because the active set is so small. The first problem might have an active set in the size hundreds, even though there might be hundreds of thousands of variables. And as you move down, the active sets get larger and larger, and warm starts help you kind of track the right solution. OK, so that's the uh, strategy taken by a lot of these methods, not only for the lasso, but for you know, all regularization problems, essentially, that follow a similar form. The idea is to, to use a pathwise strategy to solve the problem for larger value of lambdas, because coordinate sense more efficient there, and then to kind of uh, uh, cut out some variables from the inner loop, some coordinates the inner loop that you don't need to iterate over because uh, you have a sense that their values won't change across updates in the cycle. So that's called um, the package you can look up as the GlimNet package. It's written in Fortran, actually, um, but it has a port to MATLAB and R. So let me give you. Um, let me give you some theory on coordinate descent in the last five minutes, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll either convene next time if there's interest, or we'll just move on. I'll, just, I'll see whether or not people want to hear more about coordinate descent. So um, the name coordinate descent, I think, is inherently confusing. It's not really uh, a descent method as we think about something like gradient descent. It's actually more maybe appropriately called coordinate-wise minimization. But that's just what it's called. Um, in large part in, in the ML community. You could think about court descent being the following method for a smooth function. I, I look at the first variable, and I move along the direction of its gradient, univariate gradient descent, right, where I fix all the other variables at their values. And then for the second variable, I update you know, the, the function to use the most recent version of x1, and I take a univariate gradient step in that variable and so on and so forth. And I cycle through uh, in this order. So instead of performing an exact minimization, I just perform one gradient update. Um, that's probably more rightfully called coordinate descent. And now, from the optimization community, a lot of authors are calling this coordinate descent. And so there's a little bit of confusion if you read papers as to what method they're actually um, referring to. If we were to do something like uh, minimizing a smooth plus separable function, we could do the exact same thing as this, except we wrap each of these in a prox operator. Right? So that all the non-smooth part does is tell us to take a univariate proximal gradient step instead of a univariate gradient step. So they're both applicable to smooth plus separable functions. This version of coordinate descent is arguably much more broadly applicable because we don't have to apply exact minimizations. All we have to do is apply univariate proximal gradient steps. Okay, so it's, it's, it's more broadly applicable. You can guess that the former version we learned, the first one is going to make more progress per step. It's actually forming an exact minimization across each step rather than just a proximal gradient update. So most of the theory on coordinate descent is actually on this method. It's much easier to analyze than exact coordinate-wise minimization. And that's the one, this is the theory I'll refer to in the next, um, in the last five minutes. Theory for exact cyclic coordinate-wise minimization is much more sparse. And in a sense, we, we would probably guess that the theory be between these two methods should be very different. Because exact minimization, coordinate-wise, is not a first-order method. Right? It's using much more information than a first-order method. We saw it crushing gradient descent and proximal gradient. This is a first-order method. It's using the gradient at each step. It's just using a single component of the gradient. Right? So we should, we should probably expect the theory to be quite different between the two. But um, and this is closer to a first order method because it's using the gradient at each step. Um, so I, I'm just going to give you a bunch of references here and tell you what they study. This is all quite recent. And a warning is that I may have missed something because you know, papers come out every year. So it's, not, it's hard to, come to be on top of the theory for court and ascent. But as far as I understand it, here is a view of the most recent theory, theoretical understanding for court and ascent. Um, just going to mention that the Gauss-Seidel method, which is you can think about coordinate descent for linear systems, is a very old idea, and there's lots of theory studying the convergence rate of that. So that's something you can look up and say this book, Galb and Van Loon. And um, 
Aditya Ramdas, who's a PhD student here in ML, a lot of you probably know Aditya, he was uh, TA for this course last year, and actually kind of inspired by, um, I guess, some of the connections in quarter descent uh, that were mentioned in a lecture like this one, he wrote a paper on um, a modern twist at quarter descent for, for uh, linear systems. It's a very nice paper, so you can take a look at that one as well. Um, in some sense, the theory for quarter descent as of late starts with Nesterov, which is not too surprising considering that Nesterov's been so influential in other regards. So he has a 2010 paper that shows that for smooth functions, if you do this version of quarter descent, you get essentially all the same guarantees as you would for gradient descent. Okay, so you have a, um, a 1 over epsilon rate if you have a Lipschitz gradient, and under strong convex convexity, you get a linear rate. The caveat, the catch is that he is not able to analyze cyclic coordinate descent. He finds it too difficult, and he says in the, in the introduction, he's not aware of this being a tractable method to analyze at all. And so he studies randomized coordinate descent, where instead of choosing the coordinates in a cyclic order, he actually ran, randomly selects which coordinate to perform, to perform a coordinate update over. And this was an influential paper that led to a bunch of follow-up work, all of which pretty much study randomized coordinate descent. Um, because, again, I think maybe influenced by Nesterov and also the fact that it's a lot easier to study, that's what these authors look at. So this paper, I Richterich and Tuck, I don't know how to pronounce his name, maybe Tuckuck, um, extend these results to the proximal version. So it showed that proximal randomized court descent essentially gives you the same convergence rates as you would get for um, proximal gradient descent. The study of cyclic court descent is much more sparse. So I mentioned two papers here, but neither of which really do a very thorough treatment. I mean, I don't want to sound like I'm dumping on these papers. They're nice advances, but they are very far from a complete understanding of, of cyclic coordinate descent. The first one looks at um, functions that are smooth plus the L1 norm only. And it shows that in this setting, cyclic coordinate descent dominates gradient descent. So every iteration actually has better progress than gradient descent. Not only a better rate, but it strictly dominates gradient descent. However, the conditions that it puts on the smooth part, G, are very strange. So I don't know if, if you'd be able to apply it even to regression. The conditions are, are very strange ones that would, that would have implications for the variables in your regression. Um, this paper by Beck and I'm ha having an even harder time pronouncing her name, Tetra Shvili, um, studies cyclic coordinate descent for smooth functions. And it's much more general, but it does not apply to non-smooth functions. And they show kind of the standard things, right? Under Lipschitz gradient, it gets the usual rate. Under strong convexity, it gets the usual rate. But the study of cyclic coordinate descent for smooth plus separable functions, which is arguably the case we're interested in, has eluded people as of recently. And moreover, cyclic coordinate-wise minimization is just completely um, out of the picture in terms of our understanding. We think that exact minimization should perform a lot better than you know, this version of coordinate descent, but these papers don't really um, pay homage to that. They don't make that distinction very clear. And uh, it's rumored that there are some people in optimization who are dedicating a lot of effort to this right now, right, that this is a very kind of um, sought after result. So just to give you an idea of the recent theory. Um, that's it for the time today. If there's interest, we'll continue next time on Portisant. Otherwise, we'll move to, uh, I think, Proximal Newton next time. <laughs>